Thank you. So in my lab, I'm a polymer scientist, and we actually study polyelectrolytes, or charged polymers, to design particles that can target specific cells and tissues. And I'll tell you a little bit about how we do that. Uh, one of our initial goals has been to address cancer, in particular, highly aggressive forms of cancer that undergo genetic mutations that allow those cancer cells to survive chemotherapy drugs. Uh, so what we've been doing is using a, a way of essentially taking already known nanoparticles that can traverse the bloodstream. Uh, we design them so that they have a net negative charge and we stuff inside of them a chemotherapy drug. Then we wrap a positively charged layer of polymer around that nanoparticle and follow that with a layer of negatively charged nucleic acid. And those nucleic acids are siRNA and microRNAs, which essentially silence those genetic mutations that allow those tumor cells to survive. We need to protect those nucleic acids from attack from RNases that exist in our bloodstream. So we add another positively charged layer, and we essentially have a sandwich that contains our nucleic acid wrapped around our nanoparticle with the chemotherapy drug. But we can't send that down into the bloodstream because now it's a positively charged nanoparticle, and plus charge will absorb large amounts of proteins and get rapidly cleared out of the body before there's an opportunity to accumulate in the tumor. So we add, finally, another outer layer, and that is a negatively charged layer. We use charge in this case to repel the interactions of this nanoparticle with immune cells, such as monocytes, and other cells that exist in the bloodstream or other parts of the body that we don't want the nanoparticle to interact with. And because we also use highly hydrated polymers, usually polysaccharides or polypeptides that have a large attraction to water molecules, there's kind of an invisible cloak of water molecules surrounding these nanoparticles that allow them to escape as much detection from the immune system and therefore allow them to travel through the bloodstream for longer time frames, which is what we need to get into the tumor. Now, um, this leads to these nanoparticles that therefore have a core that can contain one drug and then these outer layers. And uh, we are really interested in being able to get these nanoparticles to stick to tumors. And uh, the reason for this is that once we get them into the bloodstream, they can circulate for longer time frames. They find their way into the blood vessels that belong to the tumor, and they are able to get into the tumor either through defects that exist in the blood vessels or through other processes that enable them to get across those blood vessels because they're compromised. In that case, we can see accumulation of the nanoparticles in tumors. Here you can see some mouse flank tumors, and we have quantum dots inside these nanoparticles so that you can see them accumulating in the flank tumors preferentially. Um, once they're in those tumors, though, remember that we designed them so that they would not be able to interact with other cells well. Uh, you can think about their time in the tumor very much like a pinball machine, and uh, I'm talking to an audience that actually remembers what those are, which is wonderful, because <laughs> my students don't. Um, but you know, the ball goes up and it moves around and gets in all of these nooks and crannies, and all of those are potential impacts with tumor cells that the nanoparticle has before it finds its way back into the vasculature and gets cleared out. Um, when it's doing that, we want the nanoparticle to get taken up. We need for it to be able to stick to the tumor cells and actually get taken up by them. And it turns out that we can take our stealth nanoparticle systems and utilize that outer layer to get the targeting that we need. Uh, one of the reasons for this is that there are a number of different kinds of interactions we can engage. For example, a large number of the cancer cells that we're interested in overexpress a receptor known as CD44 that binds to hyaluronic acid. And it turns out that hyaluronic acid is a wonderful highly hydrated, strongly negatively charged polysaccharide that we have been using for an outer layer. So hyaluronic acid on the outer layer is a stealth layer for all of our healthy cells, but it binds to tumor cells specifically. And here we see this in this image where the nanoparticles labeled red are actually inside of these tumor cells. You can see their nuclei is blue. 
If we take a section of tumor, we can actually see here tumor that has these protective stromal cells in blue on the outside, and the actual tumor cells are labeled with the CD44 uh, stain, and we can see them as red, and the nanoparticles is green. And we can see that after uh, a mouse has been telvein injected with our nanoparticles, these nanoparticles circulate, and they get actually into the tumor. They're able to cross the stromal layers, and at high concentrations accumulate in those tumors. So that is the idea of sort of the sticky nanoparticle. And we can actually use this then to create those therapies that are combination. For example, in the case of lung cancer, we use a model in which we can look at uh, essentially a very orthotopic or, or native net lung cancer. Uh, here we're seeing healthy mice, and when we tell vein inject and wait a while, we see that there are no nanoparticles in the lungs of healthy mice. But in the lungs of our tumored mice, we see that there's a large accumulation, about 40 to 50 fold higher. Um, these specific tumors have undergone these really aggressive kinds of uh, modifications. There's a uh, gene known as KRAS, which enables a highly aggressive form of uh, non-small cell lung cancer. And uh, we can use siRNA against that oncogene. There's also the loss of another gene, P53, which is a guardian gene in our cells. And there's a microRNA that can replace the function of that gene. So we use these nucleic acids to actually silence these tumor defense mechanisms. And when we do this in a model of lung cancer in mice, uh, we can see that when we just look at the survivability of the mice, the black line shows uh, essentially how long uh, mice survive without any treatment. Red is just the RNA. Blue is our cisplatin in our nanoparticle. But with the combination, we're able to extend the lifetime by at least 30%. Now, we're also interested in ovarian cancer. We get very excited about the opportunity to try and address a cancer that hasn't seen as much progress as uh, other cancers, such as prostate and lung cancer and breast cancer, in part because there aren't as clear genetic targets. There are a number of very nice genetic targets, such as HER2, that we have discovered in breast cancer. Um, there aren't this sort, these sort of uh, signal targets that we found in ovarian cancer. It's also a very aggressive kind of cancer and a sneaky one. It's, it's found late at advanced stages. So typically, it's uh, already progressed and often metastasized when it's found. And although 70% of patients respond to the initial treatment of chemo, uh, basically surgery plus chemo, about 70% of them afterward experience a recurrence that comes that is much more highly resistant. And it's that that actually makes ovarian cancer such an effective killer. So um, we'd like to be able to address this. Uh, this is the kind of cancer that would be promising for immunotherapy, but for some reason it has not really been highly responsive to the common immunotherapies. And so we haven't had a lot of progress over the last 30 years. So we started to look at ovarian cancer by first determining which, which of our outer layers would have a high affinity and uh, uh, essentially avidity or stickiness for our cancer cells. So we looked at a library of outer layers that uh, consisted of these natural polysaccharides and polypeptides, and we essentially did in vitro and in vivo sampling to see which ones had high affinity. And we found that there were certain nanoparticles from that library that do co-localize very effectively with tumors. Here you can see uh, the tumor luminescence uh, and the infrared signal from the nanoparticle are really right on top of each other. And even when we look in the uh, metastases that occur in the intestine, we see that there's this very nice mapping of our nanoparticle to where the tumor is, whether we inject intraperitoneally, which is into the abdomen, or intravenously, which is through the bloodstream although the IP version is going to give us better effect overall because we can get more accumulation. Uh, we found that there were three really interesting nanoparticles. One was already known to us, and that's hyaluronic acid. So we decided to look at where nanoparticles go when they associate with these tumor cells, and HA takes these nanoparticles inside the cell, as we expected. Great for delivery of siRNA and cisplatin. But we found that there were two other polymers that had an even higher avidity for these cancer cells. And in the middle case, polyalglutamic acid actually does not take these, two, these nanoparticles into the cell. It actually leaves these nanoparticles at the outer edges. And uh, they stay there indeterminately. And uh, in the third case, we have something that's somewhere in between where it takes a long time for these nanoparticles to get in. And they actually get in through a different mechanism. 
So what we were finding is that depending on which nanoparticle outer layer we choose, we could steer the nanoparticle to different parts of the cell. Now this is interesting. The first case of hyaluronic acid is great for the kinds of therapies I just described, but polyalglutamic acid could be really interesting if we want to deliver a protein to the outsides of other cells. Um, for example, um, a number of proteins are interesting if they can actually trigger uh, activity of other cells by binding to those membrane surface receptors on those neighboring cells. Then we don't want the nanoparticle to go in the cell and get ultimately degraded. And it turns out that this is actually an interesting way to activate the immune response in ovarian cancer. Uh, IL-12 is a cytokine. It's, it's known for its high potency in being able to stimulate the innate immune response. So um, this is actually an opportunity because typically IL-12 is something that can get interferon gamma, uh, one of the major sort of inflammatory modulators, uh, to uh, be excreted by a number of neighboring cells, and that ultimately leads to the stimulation and activity of T and NK cells that are going to ultimately attack the cancer. Um, however, if we deliver IL-12 directly to a patient, uh, there's a problem because it will get into the bloodstream and will cause these undesired immune responses that ultimately lead to autoimmune response that is un intolerable, and therefore uh, IL-12 alone has failed in clinical trials. So our question was, can we use our nanoparticle to encapsulate IL-12 in place of siRNA, for example, and use the stickiness on the outer layer to get these nanoparticles to bind to the outsides of cells and deliver IL-12 to their neighbors? IL-12 then signals to these outer surface receptors and gets them to essentially generate interferons. And now, bang, we, we begin to get that uh, really um, uh, effective immune response. So the first question is, can we do this, deliver IL-12 without getting the same uh, level of um, uh, toxicity? So if we look at mice dosed with just free IL-12, we see toxicity-related deaths indicated by those red arrows there and a, a, a significant amount of weight loss. But when we deliver uh, to uh, mice our IL-12 nanoparticle, we find that we don't see this uh, degree of release into the bloodstream. So this was one good sign. And here we're delivering intraperitoneally the nanoparticle, and we look at the survival, uh, and this is an orthotopic ovarian cancer model where there's a large amount, it's very aggressive, a large amount of, of loss of, of uh, life without any treatment. With the IL-12 delivered free, we actually lose some animals in the beginning stages, but we do extend life overall for those that survive. However, with our IL-12 nanoparticle, we don't see that early toxicity, and we're able to extend survivability. Not only that, but we end up seeing that 30% uh, of the animals uh, survive. Uh, so we don't get any recurrence over time when we monitor these animals, which indicate a full recovery of the cancer. We're now looking at how we can continue to adapt this approach so that we can have highly effective uh, tr uh, therapies for ovarian cancer of different types. And so for the last couple of minutes, I'm going to give you a really short example of how charge can be exciting in an area other than cancer. Uh, and this is the example of osteoarthritis, something that we all care a lot about. I care a lot about it when I run on my treadmill every day and, and feel that the distance I can make is, is slower and slower and smaller and smaller. Um, what happens in some cases is that you have an early trauma to cartilage. This could be a work accident. It can be a sporting accident. Uh, but something happens that causes you to lose a little fragment of cartilage that causes inflammation and that ultimately leads to further degradation of the cartilage. In those very early stages, we treat with cortical steroids, and that eliminates pain and decreases inflammation, but it doesn't slow that degradation over time. So ultimately, when there's that kind of damage, uh, over the long term, there's going to be a joint replacement further on in life. Uh, right now, we don't have a disease-modifying drug for osteoarthritis. The reason for that isn't that we don't understand any therapies or molecules that might be able to help us regenerate cartilage. There are some interesting proteins that can interact with cartilage cells to cause them to regenerate cartilage. However, the problem is trying to get those molecules to the cartilage cells. Uh, cartilage itself is this really dense, negatively charged matrix 
of uh, polyelectrolyte, polyanions, essentially. And uh, it, not only is it dense, uh, but it has no blood vessels. So we can't use any of our blood vessel traveling tricks that we usually use with nanoparticles. Uh, not only that, but there's a lot of clearance going on in the joint. So a lot of our therapies are going out through these lymphatic venules and vessels. So ultimately, we decided to use a very small carrier with a lot of charge. We're using a dendromer, which is a positively charged polymer. And uh, it has a large number of these charged groups. What we can do, though, is uh, address the problem that if something is this charged, it won't go very deep into the cartilage by adding these flexible chains of polyethylene glycol that flap around and essentially shield and unshield the charge, allowing us to stick and unstick or bind and unbind. This also lowers the toxicity of the molecule so that it is actually very tolerable, whereas the highly charged system is not. So we then attach our protein uh, that can stimulate chondrocy chondrocytes to produce cartilage, known as IGF-1, to this dendromer. We use polymer physics to determine kind of this sweet spot window where there's enough polyethylene glycol to do the flapping and the, and, uh, the protecting of charge, but not too much to eliminate the impact of the charge. And then we look at what happens when we inject, and we find that uh, essentially we can change the half-life of the conjugate by significant amounts. On the left is just the pure protein, and on the right is uh, the protein when it's injected in the joint, and we find uh, the dendromer conjugate gives us much longer time in the joint, about 10 times the half-life, and it's able to give us a therapeutic amount over a period of 30 days. And what that leads to, compared to the free uh, drug, is that when we create a lesion, shown on the left without uh, uh, any kind of treatment, we get, of course, this lesion persisting. If we have IGF alone, we still see that the lesion persists. But in the far right bottom corner, we can see that our treatment actually fully regenerates the cartilage. And this is something that we're really excited about and hope to bring to um, uh, translation. So I'd like to thank the students and postdocs who did all of the work and the funding agencies and my collaborators, Daryl Urban and Al Grzynski. Thank you.